Hi, I'm Melanie McFarlane, and welcome to another episode of Salon Talks. And today, I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with Sarah Silverman. Hello. Hello. Sarah has a new special out that um, debuted on HBO and is streaming on Max called Someone You Love. And I have so many questions just in terms of the, you know, the making of of someone you love there. I read the story that HBO came to you and said like, okay, time for you to do another special. You haven't done that many over the years. Um, but I want to ask a question about it in terms of the two ways that I feel like people may come to it. The first is purely from like a consumer perspective. Like if I'm watching TV and I decide I wanted to watch a stand up special and I say, Sarah Silverman comes on, I'll watch it and I'll have a certain feeling about it that I think is a little bit different from Speck of Dust, which is I felt like this was more of a kind of loose hangout with Sarah versus, you know, like stand-up special. There's a very special structure. There's a production, you know, aspect of it. This one was a lot looser. Was that was that by intention this time around? No, I I, I have very little intention. I I, I mean I I feel like I um. I mean, it's not that I never think about the big picture because I do, but um, as I put together a special and I, again, this is my fourth special in 30 years or whatever, you know, or I guess 18 years since my first special. I just never think to do a special until somebody asks me and I'm like, do I have the material? But this one, I, yeah, I uh, was part of a deal um i made before the pandemic and then all of a sudden they were like time to uh you know so i i a lot of the writing happened on the road um which is how a lot of comics do it but not usually how i do it because i do so few specials there's more of a palatable change because i'm older and different and my you know i my existence is different and the world around me is different and the things i've learned and implement and the work i do has changed and and that's the effect of that you know that's more for you slash you know the audience to to say um to to observe and and but i i'm just in it so i i don't see as yeah. much yeah so, so the second part of that that I was referring to initially is that um, you were very open about the death of your parents um, in, a, in a podcast before, I think it was right before the special was either announced or definitely before it premiered. Um, and, and by the way, I, I know these are, words aren't adequate, but I'm so sorry. Um, my yes. condolences. Um, and, and I think it's important for me. So I'll say this working through grief is a thing. I know I've done it. Um, it can be very, it can give us structure um, and it can give us a means of even processing our grief that's, that changes. Um, not many people get to do it, pub not publicly, but at least I can imagine that it must've been different for you to be in this process of um, your parents were sick for quite some time. And, and I'm imagining, and can't tell me if I'm wrong with the timeline, when you were putting this special together, you were in the throes of that. Um, so watching yeah. it, knowing that, it took on a different tone for me. And I'm just wondering, I think that's something people feel acutely now after the past couple of years with the pandemic, there has been so much grief. And I'm wondering if that brought anything into the process of putting the set together. Well, um, as I was putting the set together, I was on the road for three months and you know, I, my stepmother had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, um, but I had no idea my parents, both of them, let alone her, would be gone so soon. Like, it, I thought it would be a couple years or something, you know, um, and so from diagnosis to her passing was four months exactly almost but um but the first three were were not as dire as that final so i when i came home it was right into um 
being with them in their apartment with my sisters and and just um it, it, being on the road i was able to kind of pretend it wasn't happening but it it got realer and realer and then i came home and i canceled you know shows and i um obviously and it was just um it was just all hands on deck and i i just the we were consumed with sadness <laughs> just it it was just very all encompassing and um but it was there were weird silver linings like the you know being together you know just all of us being together and being so close and going through it together and and you know i have three sisters and and uh two nieces and a nephew came and it was you know heartbreaking and wildly sad but kind of beautiful and you know there was laughter and all this stuff i don't that couldn't have been part of your question no but but so the special isn't wildly touched by it other than knowing that my stepmom was sick and, and going through chemo and you know we're all in we were all constantly in contact you know it's like um you know we have family zoom every sunday and um we have like whatsapp you know silverman united whatsapp chain god maybe i shouldn't say the title of it i don't know how that works on okay. whatsapp it's okay it's private, right but but yeah whatsapp chains with the whole family and then just the sisters and then just the sisters without the one we're talking about the you know what i mean like we're just so up each other's asses in in a beautiful way and um uh so it, it, a lot of it is it's not within the fiber of the special but you watching it knowing what happened in the the moments between you know um takes on a new you know and and um you know in post like dedicating it to them was you know once they had passed and they and it all happened so fast so i watched it back when it premiered and then when that came up it was like oh my god you know it, it just all happened in all so many things happened all at once you know it's it that that um after the funerals which were nine days apart you know like like we were coming back to the mortuary like do we get a punch card like is there a free coffee if we you know like it just seemed like we were regulars but um there was like relief because it was so intense you know like kind of a not euphoric by any means but just like a sense of relief and and then also like just being with family and the shiva of it all but then going back to normal life, it felt good to go into normalcy, but now it's, it's, we're all on the sister's chain this morning. Like it's just kind of hitting us in all kinds of different ways. Yeah. And I, I guess the, the reason I wanted to ask that is that for me, it struck a different level of intimacy. Um, there's also, there's always a level of like partnership between that I've noticed between the comic, the performer and the audience. There's, you know, there's that, that, that give and take. You, you talk a lot, you, you talk a lot about in your work about anti-Semitism and just going through, you know, this is not unique to this set. You've done it throughout different routines that I've seen you, but this one, it was very interesting to see this level of like both going into these subjects where you're kind of joking about like Hitler, my struggle, is that not the most, the most Jewish title you've ever heard? Those kinds of things. Yeah when you put that together was there any kind of effort on your part intentional or not intentional to kind of bring in these subjects and kind of take a little bit of um the sting out of them in terms of talking about them that I think people might be feeling in everyday life like what was your approach to forming that part of your your stand-up just talking about the paradox of um me on my podcast you know talking without jokes or punchlines about anti-semitism and and being earnest and 
and then being on stage and and making basically like Jewish jokes, you know, <laughs> like very base kind of, and then saying, and then talking about the hypocrisy of it and trying to find um, some kind of way to to see it in the best light for me was a fun like uh, I don't want to say journey, but like I like uh, you know I like blending. Um, heady stuff with aggressively dumb stuff because uh that's me you know <laughs> and uh maybe everyone to a degree and um so it just felt uh honest you know in a in a way you know to to um call myself out on on you know i'm i'm a total hypocrite i mean i i think hopefully everyone can see that in themselves to a degree, you know, you're, we're different people at different times or when surrounded by different elements, you know? Yeah. And that kind of leads into what I wanted to ask you about next. And I, I know that you've spoken about this before, but there is this, I think whenever certain sets come out from certain comics, particularly one of the top four most beloved comics in America, <laughs> <laughs> watch the special. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. There you go. Um, there's this expectation of like, okay, something's going to be said. There's going to be headlines coming out of it and that kind of thing. And I wonder, first of all, like what your, what your impression of that is, because of course, you know, a lot of these folks, you know, I'm particularly re referring to like, you know, John Mulaney, or like, I know you're friends with Dave Chappelle. When people talk about this, there's this expectation of like, okay, there's a headline that's going to come out of it. Then there's a the reaction and that kind of thing. I'm wondering how you kind of, feel about that kind of idea of call and response between the perception of like there might be controversy and whether that figured at all um, into the material of, of someone you love when you were kind of putting it together. That stuff has so little um, to do with me in terms of, uh, you know, um, headlines and, uh, you know, that, that journalism or you know news outlets or or gossip outlets or whatever the outlets are whether they're heady new york times stuff or or you know page six whatever it's it is about clicks because that's how they their revenue stream works now so it's like it, 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 anything that can be made into a headline will be made into a headline and then you read it and the headline and it there's nothing really there and but people don't read past the headlines i mean often i don't myself admittedly you know and um but boy when i do i go oh that wasn't you know or it, i understand it in a whole new way what is what is your impression from someone who is in on the other side of things like do you think that that is changing our relationship with comedy and and do you feel like it may bring a certain expectation to your comedy that you may not, you know, you don't have a responsibility to meet, but do you feel right. like it's changing our expectation for, for a com for a comic and their work and their sets? Oh, changing the audience's expectation. Well, I mean, I think, oh, I, I think this answers it a little bit is like, I do, I have grown to believe that, comedy dies in the second guessing of your audience and what they want. And so as someone who is a comedian <laughs> and, and feels an onus to comedy, I, I, I don't think about, I don't try to predict what people are looking for and try to give it to them or predict what they, how they might react and then change what I do according to that i still think if i did that it's still art because it's it, it you know but it's it's not how i do it i mean i'm affected by the world and part of that world is in my audience or, or other people's audience you know but and i'm affected by the discourse of uh, you know all the the topics that are going on in the in the social politics of the world and that changes how i think and how i communicate so in that way yes but not certainly not in that direct way not i don't i'm very bad at art and commerce i mean i i could be worse i'm not that bad i i just i own a house you know <laughs> um but um but i 
I've never been very good at um, figuring that stuff out. I just kind of do my own thing and put it out and see what happens, you know, and, and talk to people like you to try to get the word out. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Speaking of getting the word out, I saw that the breakdown of the ratings, you were recently on The Daily Show as a host for a week, and you were the third most popular host in terms of ratings. Did you realize that? I did not realize that. That's very exciting. You're, oh yeah, that was the, cool. the third highest ratings, and and I'm wondering, like, what you what you kind of think about that role. Like, do you do you consider yourself like what you know? Do you consider yourself kind of in the running for that, or did you kind of go in and I know you've done guest hosting on other shows before. Um, is that something? And 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 what would be the significance, in your opinion, of like a woman being being in that role? Yeah, I think that would be great, you know, if there was a, a you know, I, I, there are so many people who would be great um, in filling those shoes. And, and I, I really had a blast doing it. I mean, it was like, the first day was like crazy. And but as the week went on, I was like, Oh, I get this. And I, I really loved it i felt like oh i could thrive doing this like i really understand this job like and 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 um the executive producer jen flans you know it, it, it's just it's it was such a lesson in immediacy and comedy which is funny because i'm a stand-up but i i'm a slow honer you know and sure on my podcast it's fast and loose but like you know it seems loose and immediate but it's you know it's I'm thinking about tiny little articles and things and, and stitching things together pretty more meticulously than it looks. Mm -hmm. And but with The Daily Show, Jen Flan sits there and you're there with the writers and you're working on stuff. And if you're onto something, but you're you're trying to tweak it, she'll go uh, use it or move on. You know, she's watching the clock and it's so th thrilling because she just keeps you on on track and it's this you know it's really kind of that um the the per perfect is the enemy of good you know but like you have to go with stuff and and just do it or cut it or you know make heart you know big decisions fast and and move on mm -hmm. move on yeah you know i mean that that just makes me think of the song move on from that Sondheim musical, uh, Sunday in the Park with George, which is all about art and that stuff, you know, like the lyrics to that really makes me think of this. But anyway, it was it was really exciting. I thought, oh, I would love this, but I really don't think I could um, do that for a, a kind of indefinite amount of time. I, I don't have the I don't have the stamina of I think most people. I just. I need a lot of, I actually, my mother is this way too. Like I can go, go, go. And then I need a lot of rest. And I really love doing odd jobs. I love acting. I love podcasts. I love stand up. I love, you know, all these different things I get to do. And a job like that for me, I know like Trevor would go off for the weekends and do stand up. I can't do that. I would need to be in silence and rest for like the other days and so it would really i mean no one offered me the job <laughs> it was like but the but thinking about it i don't think i could do it even though i think i would love it you know if i were younger maybe or or on a different trajectory but i i like doing other things more if it was a finite amount of time i think i'd love it though yeah mm -hmm. which was that, and it was great so it sounds like you did it for fun mainly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And and just that probably was the reason why it, it went well, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know. Really when that. it matters most is when you shit the bed, you know. Like, but when you're just like, ah, oh, this is so fun. What a oh, cool, you know. Like, what an experience. It tends to go well because you don't have these things fighting you in your head you know with your experience of doing i love you america where you're doing talk variety not necessarily late might because it's streaming did that right. form your expectation of you know going in for the daily show not in terms of i'm going for this job or more like this is this is what i'm going for you know i'm, I'm going into this experience um 
of topical comedy. And this is, you know, this is what I think is going to happen. Um, just having that, that experience did from, I love you, America, did that inform any part of um, your experience? With yeah. I mean, I, there, nothing was a crazy surprise. Like I, I, I know a lot about that process, mm -hmm. but it was like that process on a daily level is, is totally, it is the same and totally different in terms of like, there's something special in not being able to tinker with the minutia of things. So, you know, in the Hulu show, uh, you know, we did, it was a weekly show and we had lead up time to be working on stuff. So it was, it was very, you know, it, it was, there was a lot of time to tinker on every little thing. And there's, there's something really that I didn't learn until doing this. And I mean, when I, I guess hosted Jimmy Kimmel Live a couple times and, and being around that, that's also very immediate, you know, it's the same, you know, but it's, but the, but the, 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 that probably more informed the speed of it. The Hulu show informed kind of like the, the process, but faster, but it was its own thing. And it's such a well-oiled machine and uh so jumping into it was um i i was able to be pretty prepared for what it would be like but i also um my boyfriend also ran the show for several years with john stewart so he had lots of tips and and his ex-wife is jen flans who runs the show now and so, um, and which is funny because he writes for Jimmy Kimmel Live now. So it's like, it was a real like- Circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was, there was so much I learned about, about comedy really in, in that kind of high octane uh, um, version of it, you know? Yeah. Just one more, just one more question about this. I, I have been, I mean, I'm not surprised because I've been watching, I've been in this business for, you know, writing about it for more than 20 years at this point. One of the reasons that I'm doing this story about late women and late night or topical talk variety is that there haven't been, unless a show is created for a woman, there haven't been any women in substantially like in the running for the legacy shows for like, except for the daily show when there was a turnover between John and Trevor you know, and this is a seven decades old format almost. I'm wondering as someone you are in the industry. I mean, Joan, Joan is the only one you can point to that's that even came close to one of those legacy chairs. Yeah. And because she had the nerve to do what was best for her career, she was blackballed for decades. Yep. I mean, wow, that's, that's the male ego at work because it was Carson angry he wasn't angry at you know leno he wasn't angry at you know it, he, but he was angry at her like she should turn down an opportunity at something he knew she was elite at you know you know and then that leno carried that on was odd i mean i you know and it wasn't until Jimmy Fallon took over and like immediately had her on that he broke that. But but the fact that we're pointing still to Joan, I mean, Chelsea Handler, I would say, ha, you know, made a like made room for herself in that and still doesn't get, in my view, the the um, reference to she doesn't get referenced in that oddly. Um, enough i think mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but um yeah yeah no i that and that's the thing like you know i was very surprised i mean <laughs> i say like as a person in the world i'm surprised as someone who knows this industry i'm not very surprised but uh, you know from your perspective do you have any like does it surprise you that women haven't been more considered for these roles over the years i mean you know, you've been, you've been doing this for, like you said, you've been, you've been on in, in stand-up comedy and in these circles for three decades at this point, you know, so. I mean, I mean, if you look at the big powerhouse women talk show hosts from comedy, it's Ellen and Rosie, and they're both in daytime, 
you know, you could say relegated to daytime, but they may have also been, it may have been their, exactly their lane and they certainly got immense success from it. But, you know, it is really odd and it, it but also I, as someone who loves, who, who grew up on late night TV and late night talk shows and also really came into um, existence in comedy th through being guests on there, I'm really appreciative, but as just a, objectively, it's, it's beyond a dying form. I mean, is that okay to, I mean, I, I, I have say, I say that in my story, no, you're not saying anything, anything people don't know. <laughs> But I mean, this article is really interesting that you're writing because it comes kind of at the precipice of the, the death of of late night because, you know, it, even promoting like I can't promote this special on any late night shows because of the strike. But the truth is what we see of late night shows are clips from monologues mostly online and not really like celebrity interviews unless something goes wildly awry, you know. And so it's it's interesting yeah yeah you know, and everything's going to streaming and yet um kind of topical things haven't reached streaming quite as much but more than usual i think people watch i actually think people watch like the tonight show and jimmy kimmel live on you know hulu and or peacock often or something i don't know the you would know these numbers and things but. yeah yeah it's just and interesting to think yeah, and it's you know, I mean, there's, um, it's kind of the the whole thing is is interesting to me, but yeah, it is coming to a time when the art, let's say, like the genre is at least in position for rebirth or some sort of some sort of massive overhaul. Um, so so yeah, um, to go back, I mean, the last thing I would want is for, well, not that I don't want women to have a chance in late night, but like as it's about to die to put you know put women to be the ones who are killing it you know like now you know what i mean whoever's there it's gonna end soon i think i mean i hope not or maybe it finds a new way through but yeah uh, you're you're already there so, yeah. yeah 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 yeah. i'm really interested to read it <laughs> remember those old volvo commercials where you saw the volvo go over the cliff and it kind of stayed the volvo do you remember those they were very these old things where they're the boxy cars yeah so i keep on thinking of that it's like you know all of a sudden it's like well i'm gonna step out you you take the wheel now right so, you know it's time for women to take the wheel like yeah. just 800 meters from the from the cliff yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but I want to, I want to end this talking about, um, someone you love and connecting it to, I love you America. Cause I, well, last time that we spoke again was for that. And one of the things that I loved about that show was the idea of empathy. And it came together at this time when a lot of people, you know, just the country was just riven in terms of the, the partisanship between just, you know, even in films, it's still there. But you had this show where part of the idea of approaching topical comedy and different, um, you know, s social issues and politics was actually reaching out and finding an attempt to find common ground. And I'm wondering, A, has that changed? And B, did you carry any of that experience, not from the structure of the show, but the experience of reaching out and being with other people in unfamiliar territory for you, either politically or socially, did you carry that into making someone you love? I, to a degree, yeah, for sure. And you know, it's interesting what you said about, I think I'm, I, I'm hoping I tie this all together without getting lost, but oh, I'm already kind of lost. Um, I like have no brain cells right now. Like I'll, I'll, I'll be in the middle of a thought and my boyfriend will go, start asking me something. I'll go, no, 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 don't talk. You know, like I'm like, so afraid to lose my train of thought because it's constant anyway. Um, when you talked about the loose parts of the special, it's interesting because this, the, I did two nights. I shot one show and then the next night it, as another show. And the second night was way loose and a couple heckled and it was really interesting talking about you know, like it, it, it was so in the moment and 
came kind of full circle and was like totally something you don't see in specials because it was like heckler something and I was so excited about it and I was like we'll just use the second night I love those the heckles and what happened and the back and forth and the the like um the it was really neat and the editor's like I don't think you're gonna like it I go I know I like it I was there it was it was so in the moment and you don't see that in specials and he sent me the like clips of like those moments and it really didn't play there are a couple moments that are in there that that are like you know cool like that but there were really big moments that had were away from the material and totally just talking to this and but it it's so funny and it, it's why i think like stuff like improv doesn't doesn't translate to television or magic even really to it is because somewhere in the audience's mind even though they don't know the technicalities of it they know that things could be edited and changed in post-production even if they don't understand the work you know whatever but and so you don't buy it as much as if it were live and you're you're there and um it, it's almost like you know that that animation that's too real and it w creeps people out you know that that yeah Mm -hmm. It was like that, like it just you don't buy that it's in the moment, even though the truth was it 100% was and I ended up not including any of it, except for those few moments that you see. This was great. Thank you so much, Sarah, for for talking with me and for everybody who's watching. Please go to Max and watch Someone You Love. It's a wonderful special and hang out with Sarah with there or at her podcast. You'll feel much better. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was lovely.